There are six levels of driving automation defined by the SAE International Standard J3016, ranging from level 0, no automation, to level 5, full automation. This chart from SAE International describes the automation levels in more detail. Level 0, no automation, simply describes most of the cars on the road today, which basically includes all of the cars without at least adaptive cruise control. Level 1, driver assistance, defines cars with a driver assistance system of either steering or acceleration braking. The systems monitor just some of the total driving environment. The human must supervise the system and perform all remaining driving tasks. Handoff can happen at any time, and the driver must always be ready to take over. This level is typically associated with cars that offer adaptive cruise control, which many high-end cars now offer as an option. I have this on my Tesla and use it all the time. It feels like you have a tractor beam on the car in front of you. It's great in stop-and-go traffic, and is primarily meant for highways. My foot literally only touches the power pedal a fraction of the time I drive. Care has to be taken with this feature on local roads because if there is no car in front of you when you approach red light or stop sign, like with normal cruise control, the car will not stop. However, at red lights, the car will come to a complete stop if there's a car in front of you, as in this example. Here you can see I'm in my Tesla with the cruise control set to 27 miles an hour car came to a stop at the red light. Once the red light turns green, the car in front moves forward and the adaptive cruise control starts up again. Level 2, or partial automation, defines cars with multiple driver assistance systems that include both steering and acceleration braking. The system monitors just some of the total driving environment. The human must supervise the system and perform all remaining tasks. Handoff can happen at any time, and the driver must always be ready to take over. This includes Tesla's Autopilot, Mercedes-Benz Drive Pilot, Infiniti's Active Lane Control, and BMW's Active Driving Assistance Plus. Car and driver put these semi-autonomous cars through a rigorous test. Car and driver said that the Tesla came out the clear winner with the lowest number of lane control interruptions and the only car with lane change capability. They differ slightly in how they operate, but mostly on how long they stay engaged if your hands are off the wheel. I use Tesla's Autopilot on my Tesla all the time. It can only be engaged when the car can clearly see lines in the road on both highways and local roads. It's flawless on highways, and I engage it more than two-thirds of the time of my commute to work every day on both highways and local roads. Here I have it engaged on a local road with just one center line. Here I approach a fairly sharp curve. The Tesla handles it, but you have to be very careful in level 2 automation because the car can hand off control to you at any time. Level 3, or conditional automation, the car will have multiple driving assistance systems and it will monitor the complete driving environment and perform all the driving tasks. However, there is an expectation the human driver will respond appropriately to a request to intervene. So this is similar to level 2, however the car should be able to perform many more driving tasks and perhaps give the human more notice when it needs assistance. Today in level 2, the cars expect to be able to hand off control to the human at any time. There are no cars with level 2 conditional automation available today. Level 4 or high automation, the car will have multiple driver assistance systems and will monitor the complete driving environment and perform all the driving tasks, even if the human driver will not respond appropriately to a request to intervene. So this is very close to full automation. However, this assumes that the car is perhaps operating in a controlled area, for example, ones with limited speed, or at certain times of the day, or under certain weather conditions. Finally, with level 5 full automation, the car will have a full-time automated driving system and will perform all the driving tasks under all roadways and environments. The human can simply manage the system and does not need to intervene. The following is a very good presentation from Toyota at this year's CES show about the complexities of achieving level 5 autonomy. All car makers are aiming to achieve level 5 autonomy. In level 5 autonomy, the car can drive fully autonomously 
under any traffic or weather condition at any place and at any time. No human being required. I need to make it perfectly clear. It's a wonderful, wonderful goal. But none of us in the automobile or IT industries are close to achieving true level five autonomy. We are not even close. And collectively, our current prototype autonomous cars can handle many situations, but there are still many others that are beyond current machine competence. And it's going to take many years of machine learning and many more miles than anyone has logged, both in simulated and real world testing to achieve the perfection that's required for level five autonomy. Luckily, there's good news because SAE defined not only level five, but level four. And level four is almost as good as level five, but it turns out that it will have a much shorter timetable for arrival. Level four is a fully autonomous car that only works in specific operational design domains. An example of such a domain is M-City, which is a test facility that exists near the University of Michigan and that we and other car manufacturers use as a test site. We can design at that test site various restrictions to test level four. It could include limited areas of operation, limited speeds, limited times of the day, limited weather, any one of those things. So when it comes to company A or company B or company T saying that it hopes to have autonomous vehicles on the road by the early 2020s, it's level four that's the technology that is probably being referred to. TRI believes it's very likely that a number of manufacturers will have level four autonomous systems operating in specific locations within a decade. And level four autonomy will be especially attractive and adaptable for companies that offer mobility as a service because ride sharing and car sharing and inner city last mile models match up and may well offer the best application for bringing level four to the market sooner. Moving down the ladder, let's look at level three. Again, to make sure that we're all sharing the same vocabulary. Level three is a lot like level four, but with an autonomous mode that at times may need to hand off control to a human driver who may not be paying attention at the time. Handoff, of course, is the operative term and a difficult challenge. In level three, as defined by the SAE, the autonomy must ensure that if it needs to hand off control of the car, it will give the driver sufficient warning. Additionally, level three must also ensure that it will always detect any condition that requires such a handoff. Because in level three, the driver is allowed to disengage and is not required to oversee the autonomy. Instead, they may engage fully in other tasks, like reading a book, checking your email, looking at your phone. The term that SAE uses when a vehicle system can't handle a particular dynamic driving task is a request to intervene. And so the challenge lies in how long it takes for a human driver to disengage from texting or from reading once the autonomy requests this kind of a fallback. It also depends on whether the autonomy system can absolutely ensure that it will never miss a situation where a handoff is required. Now, considerable research shows that the longer a driver is disengaged from the task of driving, the longer it takes for that driver to reorient and get back into driving. Furthermore, at 65 miles an hour, a car travels around 100 feet every second. That's a long distance. It means that to give a disengaged driver, let's say 15 seconds of warning, at that speed, the system has to spot trouble 1,500 feet away or around five football fields ahead. That's an extremely hard guarantee for a level three system to provide, and it's very difficult to achieve. Now, regardless of the speed, a lot can happen in 15 seconds. So picking that as a time to reorient a driver, ensuring that is very, very difficult. And it means that it may even be possible that level three is as difficult to accomplish as level four. So let me again, by way of sharing our vocabulary, bring us down to level two. Level two is perhaps the most controversial right now because it's already here, it's already functioning in some cars on public roads. In level two, a vehicle handoff to a human driver can occur at any time with only a second or two of warning. It means the human driver must be able to react mentally and physically at a moment's notice. 
Even more challenging is the requirement for the level two human driver to always supervise the operation of the autonomy, taking over control when the autonomy fails to see danger ahead. If you want to understand level two, you must remember that drivers must always monitor the autonomy, sort of like tapping on the brake to disengage adaptive cruise control when we, as a driver, see debris in the road that the adaptive cruise control sensor doesn't detect. This can, this will happen in level two systems, and we must never forget it. Human nature, not surprisingly, remains one of our biggest concerns at TRI. There are indications that many drivers may either undertrust or overtrust a system. When someone overtrusts a level two system's capabilities, they may mentally disconnect their attention from the driving environment and wrongly assume that level two systems are more capable than they actually are. We at TRI worry that overtrust can accumulate over many miles of hands-free driving at level two. And paradoxically, the less frequent the handoffs occur, the worse the tendency to overtrust may become. There's also evidence that some drivers may deliberately test the system's limits. They essentially may misuse the autonomy in a way that it was not intended to be used. So we need to think a lot about situational awareness and mental attention. It turns out that maintaining this kind of awareness that's required while engaged in monitoring tasks has been well studied for 70 years. Research psychologists call this the vigilance decrement. The research started during World War II when it became clear that radar operators looking for enemy movement became less effective as their shift wore on, even if they kept their eyes on the task. So in 1948, a research psychologist named Norman Mackworth wrote a seminal paper. It was called The Breakdown of Vigilance During Prolonged Visual Search. The experiment that he performed used a clock that he devised that only had a second hand, except that the second hand would occasionally and randomly jump by two seconds instead of one. So it turns out that if, even if you keep your eyes on the clock, on the Mackworth clock, this graph here shows that over two hours of time, your performance at detecting these two second jumps will decrease in pro proportion to how long you do it. So as I promised you at the beginning, we're gonna give you a test. It's a 20 second long test that I warned you uh, you were gonna have, but it's not too long, so let's see how it goes. I want you to watch the second hand of this clock here, which just like Mackworth did, every time the hand bumps by two seconds, instead of one second, I want you to clap your hands. So we'll have you do the Mackworth test. You ready? Here we go. Wow, that was pretty good. Let's see if we can detect it even better. All right, excellent. You guys did great, you all get A's. <laughs>